Hey, it's Tim Patterson. This is Trade Show Guy. Uh, Monday morning coffee. I know it's only come along every two or three weeks now, but uh, you know, that's the way it is. I'm kind of backing off a little bit. Uh, this is uh, for Monday, November 1st. Hope you had a good Halloween last night. Um, you can find us at tradeshowguy.net. That's kind of our hub, our jumping off spot for all the other stuff. We've got the uh, exhibit design search. There's a couple of books that you can get there on trade show marketing. Uh, there's some freebie downloads, of course, links to our main Trade Show Guy exhibit site, links to our blog. It's all right there at uh, tradeshowguy.net. And if uh, where you ever are, you are listening to this too, whether it's uh, on the website or uh, the blog or on Apple or uh, SoundCloud, make sure and give a review, um, leave a thumbs up, whatever the thing is <laughs> that you do with those. One of the most important aspects of trade show marketing, of course, is the function of gathering the leads, grading them, making sure you have all the information to follow up with. Who wants what? When do they want it? What kind of meeting is it? Is it online? Is it a Zoom call? Is it in person? All that stuff. The old fashioned way, of course, was to just uh, jot it down on the back of a business card or barring that uh, in a notebook, piece of paper, something like that. There's problems with that. But, you know, some people I know still do that. And if it works, you know, why fix it, right? Uh, then along came a long time ago, QR code scanners where you'd rent some device and scan the badge and you'd get minimal information about who came by your booth. And sometimes I've actually been by booths that shows and someone just kind of grabbed me and said, Hey, can I scan your badge? I had nothing to do with the, I wasn't interested in their product. They just wanted to scan my badge. And I think, Hmm, why would they do that? Well, of course, things have come a long way. Technology has changed. Uh, fast forward to the present. It's much easier to get more specific information into your lead capture, which of course means there's quite a bit of competition in that space because everyone wants to help you out. Uh, so on today's podcast, I got a chance to speak with Ed Vining of eventcapture.com. I was curious to learn more about how far the technology has come. A uh, really good conversation. I learned a lot and I hope you do too. I want to welcome Ed Vining of uh, eventcapture.com to Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee. Ed, uh, you're in a place that I want to visit uh, during the winter, which is Sun Valley. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, thanks, Tim. I appreciate you taking some time. And uh, I, I stumbled onto your podcast the other day, and I was totally fascinated by you and your conversation and your guests. And I'm uh, quite excited to be here today. Well, you know, when, when you reached out and I appreciate you doing that, I was curious. So I looked at what the company is and I thought, well, that's kind of in, you know, the wheelhouse of the kind of things that I like to talk about on this show, because it's industry related, trade show related, event related, all of that. So let's uh, start at the top. What is Event Capture and what do you guys do? Event Capture is an app based solution for um, typically smaller events that uh, where the event coordinator wants to offer lead retrieval or the ability to capture or record the leads and the conversations from uh, those uh, from particular events and have everything in a list, in a spreadsheet. So instead of a pocket full of business cards at the end of the show, maybe with some handwritten gibberish written on the back, you actually end up with a spreadsheet uh, the process, of course, is scanning a badge with a phone or a tablet, adding a couple of qualifiers, going through a little, a short little survey or a checklist, uh, adding some notes, talk to Tim on this day about this product, and then having the ability for the event coordinator or the exhibitor to, to track and to score the event based on the number of leads, uh, good leads that they've got instead of wondering if these business cards will ever amount to anything. And it allows for instant follow-up, uh, accurate follow-up, because you're instead of sending a message out, hey, great to see you at X event, you're able to talk specifics about what that conversation was at the event. And you got it all in a spreadsheet and it's, um, it's pretty simple. It's, it's the process of capturing leads and encouraging or allowing fast and effective follow. So uh, your, your client is actually the organizer of the it show is. versus the exhibitor? Okay. Yep. Uh, my client is the one putting on the show, uh, the one uh, looking to provide additional value for their exhibitors. And in most cases, they are the ones that are um, either offering it or purchasing it for their exhibitors or passing their exhibitors along to us and then we sell it. 
It sounds like it might be um, a, a couple of different business models or, or way that logistically that would work. You're, if you're selling it to them, they're going to sell that to their their exhibitors as an add-on, or they're just going to offer it as a package as part of their whole deal. What is what is a typical use, or is it just kind of different from show to show? Um, it, it, it's it's either one or the other. Typically, it, it's either an add-on um, that the exhibitor either uh, buys and resells or the exhibit, uh, excuse me, the event coordinator either buys and resells or the exhibitor. In some cases, we deal directly with the exhibitor. Um, but in most cases, it's uh, the event coordinator wanting to add value to their particular event by giving uh, their exhibitors the tools. And the fact that uh, it's an app for the phone, it means anyone and everyone can basically participate, use yeah. the software, use the technology, and at the end of the show, have a spreadsheet of everyone they talked to. Well, you know, I I mean, I can't believe this, but I'm I'm in my 20th year in this industry. <laughs> uh, so, but I, one of the very first things I heard when I got into this industry, I'd read about, I'd try to learn, I'd interview uh, consultants and experts and exhibitors. And one mm -hmm. thing that kept coming back to me that I just had a hard time believing and wrapping my head around was that 80% of the leads that are captured in a trade show are not followed up on. And that to me has always astonished me, but that actually is, you know, surveys over the years shows that's actually pretty accurate. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, from the, you know, back in the old days when it was all handwritten, it was put in the crate, never taken out of the crate uh, to getting lost digitally, or just there wasn't good information there. There's a lot of stuff. So it, from the way you describe this, you know, there's some customization things you can add notes and stuff. So it seems like that that's a really big challenge for exhibitors uh, and, and for people that actually want to get followed up with. So, you know, walk me through the process of if I'm, I'm walking up to the, the show and, and I'm, my badge is being scanned. What kind of questions can the, the exhibitor then ask me that will help make that a good lead and, and they want to follow up with me? Well, we have a, a standard list of five or six that I, that I think anyone and everyone, um, whether you're using a paper form or a digital app on a device, there are things such as immediate need. That's our right. first checkbox. Does this person need what I'm selling immediately? So that indicates, well, this is a hot lead. Uh, the right. others include uh, schedule a demo, uh, request a quote, um, add to an email list, or a current customer. So these are checkboxes that instantly allow someone to look at this, uh, you know, basically it's, it's a breakdown of, of an individual, of a prospect, and able to see, well, this person has an immediate need. They, uh, so, so when they get into a system, whether it's Salesforce or some other automation system, which most of the exhibitors and most of the businesses that attend shows have automation on, in the background working. They, they're able to align with existing um, kind of parameters in their system. So they know this person's a current customer. That obviously is a different conversation than someone who is a new prospect who, and who has an immediate need. Being able to have different conversations with these people uh, based on <laughs> Well, you know, follow-up conversations based on what was discussed at the event, that's critical. Sending someone the same message after a show saying, it was great to see you, you know, that, <laughs> that's kind of a dead end. There's no- It's a cookie cutter. Yeah, it doesn't it work. Is. And so we, we it's, it's basically putting in, in a process that allows for more effective follow-up. When I follow up with Tim, I remember he likes the Cubs uh, or, or, or the Mariners or whatever. <laughs> and oftentimes that little personal anecdote uh, that it allows for a, a smoother follow-up and a, a faster reconnection between people that obviously at a show, you talk to a lot of people and it's hard to keep them all straight. Even if you talk to 10 people, we've done a couple of tests where you talk to 10 people and then you go back and, and are tested on what each of these people wanted based on your memory it's it's ridiculous how how bad we are at recalling things when we've met a lot of people in a short period. Yeah, I've learned over the years that you think, oh, I talked to this guy. It was a great conversation. I know exactly what he wants. And then it, you, it, you know, three days later, you've talked to 400 other people and you think back and you go, oh, my God, I forgot to write down something there. No, and, you know, and it used really to be it used to be you'd write it back on the business card, which. 
you know, now so many business cards have stuff on both sides of them and you, there's no room for the notes and if everything. People are so, even carrying business cards anymore. So. I guess one of my, my, my pet peeves over the years, and it just goes back several years, the first kind of lead capture scanning I saw was that it really was kind of a, a one size fits all. Uh, and it sounds like there's a lot of customization built into that. You know, you can, you can write down like, oh, this guy is actually a decision maker. This guy is just a salesperson, but I can get in touch with him and he can put me up there. Those types of things, it sounds like when you're checking the boxes, demos, um, immediate need, add to list. Seems like there is a level of customization in there that uh, was not there, say, 10 years ago in some of these scanning things. Yeah, and, and that's that's the evolution that we've seen, um, especially, again, what really comes down to are these marketing automation platforms, the CRMs and uh, right. other marketing automation platforms that require more information than just this person's name and company and title. And if you can check a box that says decision maker, and have that as part of his profile, you treat that profile a little differently. <laughs> yeah. prospect a little different than, you know, someone who maybe uh, was an intern. So uh, this works at trade shows. Great. Are there other situations where you've seen this work or are you even looking at other situations, events, conferences? Uh, well, well uh, it's, it's funny. We, we evolved uh, our initial app introduction was in 2012 and it was basically based. Uh, it was, kind of a follow-up to an earlier, we've had a number of companies in, in the golf industry in the aughts primarily, where our, the challenge was capturing information offline and getting it online and building a bridge. So we started with an iPad app that basically turned that device into a kiosk. So, oh, you want people to enter a contest. You want people to take a survey. We had and we still do kiosks that, uh, mm -hmm. that basically you take an iPad, you can turn this thing into a survey machine or a contest machine or a birthday machine. That means they go up, enter their name, enter their email, give them their birthday and boom, you've got an automated marketing platform that can, if you've got a, an email system, a constant contact or a MailChimp, you can send that person a birthday message really simply. As we evolve through the, uh, the teens, <laughs> um, we began, our initial integration was constant contact and MailChimp. So we were, uh, we had these instant customers that said, I want to get these names uh, from an event or a show, uh, primarily B2C into my MailChimp or into my constant contact. So we built automatic integrations the, and, and our company was basically built on constant contact and their customers providing them a mechanism with an, with, a, uh, with an iPad. As we moved through towards the mid-teens, uh, people wanted uh, integrations to Salesforce. So pretty, we were a small company, short feedback loop. We were able to build these integrations to Salesforce and then to Marketo. And then they wanted to use, they wanted to scan badges. So then everything was moving away from the iPad and more towards the phone and an app right. that could scan badges and then do all those new qualification checkboxes and then pipe it right into Salesforce or Marketo. So it's been an evolution. We didn't start out in the trade show business as much as the golf, uh, you know, consumer show area. <laughs> and then we've just were dragged into more of the B2B side. Of course, that's, that's where the budgets were bigger. That's where the, uh, that's where the value of the prospects were greater. And so it was kind of a natural progression for us to move into uh, more of a trade show scenario. But we've all, I've, I've been hired by um, like a job expo where they had a lot of employers and a lot of employees coming in and we badged all the, all the prospects and the employers had their phones and were scanning and qualifying job prospects. And, and, and so we, I see a lot of opportunities uh, as it relates to the digital collection of data from large groups in a, you know, in a controlled environment. Do you have a lot of competition in that area? It seems like there'd be a number of companies that see that as a ripe spot. Um, there are a few. We just, one of our biggest uh, competitors actually didn't survive the downturn or I should oh, say yikes. the COVID-19 yeah. uh, break. So I have been uh, fielding requests from uh other event coordinators and registration companies that have that used this other company in the past. And so 
it, it's as if there, there are competitors, much of them on the larger scale side. Right. Uh, when you think about um, kind of the big show CES, they're using huge lead retrieval systems that are integrated right. into registration systems. That's not what we do. We work with uh, primarily the smaller uh, conference organizers. It seems like smaller companies have a better chance to succeed, like even through the recession 12 years ago, because uh, uh, the mid-sized companies, you know, they had a lot of debt. And, and I'm just talking about exhibit companies in that industry because I saw a lot of them fall. But the smaller ones made it through. The big ones, of course, they're doing so many things. They've got the budget, the money to do whatever they want, right? So, no, we're not, so we're it seems like if you're smaller, you're, you're, often, you're in a, often in a better situation, interestingly yeah. enough. It, uh, it, was, it was a blessing. Uh, both of our, and I'm, I've got basically two companies. Both of them were able to kind of hunker down and, you know, allocate, reallocate resources and under, with the understanding that, it, yeah, things were eventually going to come back. Uh, was it going to look the same as before? Yeah. Maybe, maybe not, but we're already seeing um, first and foremost from the, from the ex, from the old company that went away, I, I've got a number of great new, uh, new partners. And then as it, as we move towards, as more events come back online, uh, ideally, my customer is one of those that really wants to offer um, the ability to track th their success at an event. Yeah. And you know, if those event coordinators, coordinators must understand, most people are exhibiting for one reason, and that is to get good leads. And once, <laughs> once, right. that, once they understand that, we partnered with them to be able to provide them that platform to do that. Well, you know, that's that's kind of where we're all coming from is to to grow the business and trade shows are a great way to do it. But and there's a lot of data out there. And I like the data collection aspect of it because I, I kind of uh, get to be a data geek on occasion. So it'll be great to see how you guys do. Uh, any final words on how like for how you guys working through the last hopefully the last few months or half a year of the covid <laughs> challenges? Well, I, we went 14 months without, you know, it was quiet. Yeah. There was we, nothing yeah, us, coming in. Us and too. Had, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as you know, um, so I had a great, I had a great list of clients beforehand and, and they're coming back now um, and, you know, making plans for 2022. So we're definitely encouraged by the interest and by, I think there's going to be some pent up demand too, as you might imagine. People, yeah, we're well, seeing I, a little bit of that. Yeah, you know, get me to that event. Uh, yeah, it might right. be it might be the association boondoggle, but we all know that that's there are a lot of great things that come from that, whether they be the you know continuation of personal relationships or actual sales uh, that right. can be kind of drawn back to a conversation they had at a trade show a year or so ago. So we're, uh, we're encouraged. We're starting to kind of, things are kind of getting back to normal. Got our fingers crossed. But um, in the meantime, we're, uh, I'm, I'm reaching out to folks like you and yeah. reconnecting with some of the others in the industry who I haven't spoken to uh, in hopes that they're still around and still doing what they were doing before. Well, I would echo all of those sentiments uh, that you just recapped. So uh, where can people find you? Uh, we are at www.event-capture.com and feel free to reach out. We have a contact button. I'd love to, to, to cool. make a friend, if not a new uh, client, that's fine. Again, we're just trying to get some traction back as the industry comes back. And so far, so good. Everyone's been great. I think there's um, there's more than ever. I think there's uh, in the industry a desire to help every, help everyone along. And I've, I've honestly felt that since um, since we've been back. Probably. Yeah, we're all in it together. We may be competing with each other, but we're all in the same boat, as they say. So exactly. Well, uh, if I make it over and I hope to make it over to Sun Valley, we'll do some runs. We'll look for you, Tim. Count on it. Reach out to me before you do. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks again, Ed Vining of Event capture.com. I uh, really appreciate Ed for spending some time and sharing what is going on with their company and in that space. This week's one good thing is what I call the low budget alternative. And there's a lot of them to AirPods as much as I love Apple. And I got a lot of Apple products. I've got a phone, I've got iMac, you know, I've got a laptop and other things. Uh, but I wanted to get, cause I don't use them that often. I didn't think it was worth the two or $300 to get AirPods. So I found an alternative Wise, W-Y-Z-E, Wise Buds. I thought, well, I'll try them out. They're 
45 or 50 bucks, you know, to get them. And uh, I really, really like them. Uh, they, you know, they charge up great. They connect with any little uh, device that you've got uh, through Bluetooth. And uh, I, I guess I'm going to try them skiing this winter. Although I'm a little, you know, uh, nervous about that because if you fall down and you lose them in the snow, they're gone. Although it is black. At least they're not white like AirPods where you'd never find them again. So uh, we'll see. But the other thing, of course, is, like I say, they're not very expensive. They'd be easy to replace, right? Hey, have yourself a great week. Let's do this again soon here on Trade Show Guy Monday Morning Coffee. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.